and actually just to take off, um, take from your lead, uh, talking about the, our old brain, right? The old processing of our brain. There's something that um, when you look at, you know, the reason why people never recovered, you know, well, one of the reasons, and again, this is my belief. So, uh, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm always open to have somebody going, yeah, that's not really quite true. You're kind of there. So, uh, so never take what I say as gospel because I'm thinking it loud and I see evidence, but maybe I just want to see it. But I see good evidence the way I train people makes sense, right? Because I'm not dealing with a problem, the actual trauma. I'm dealing with the fact that they're physically incongruent and they're, they're, they have no core strength. So what am I, even if I could fix the injury, what am I fixing it to? There's nothing there. They're just, they're, their body's incommiserate. It's not working. So unless I contend with this, there's no point even dealing with the knee, the hip, the shoulder, because it's not going to stick. Yeah, I, I, I just interrupt you for one second. That's yeah. amazing. Like everything you said is mind blowing. I've been quiet because I've been like, wow, that's <laughs> really, really amazing. And, and I was having a discussion with a friend just the other day, and it was about that. It was we were just talking just yesterday about um, you know Wayne Dyer and how he was unpopular with a lot of uh, psychologists. And saying, because to understand the, the 3D world and if you will, like the fourth dim dimension, right. fifth, and that's kind of things and understanding that this is just um, an illusion or like that this part of it is a reflection yeah. and we're all vibrating at a certain speed. And so I think it's brilliant the, the way that you're looking at it, I think the, the right way. And, and, and it's, it's very refreshing. So, yeah, I'm just super interested. Yeah, please yeah. Well, well, it, well, it is interesting, right? Because you're looking at, you know, I mean, you know, the world itself right now, I mean, from what we can see, it's not in a good place. I mean, people are not doing well physically, they're not doing well emotionally or spiritually. And so is it that complex? So uh, Jordan Peterson, I listened to 150 hours of his stuff, like it was just, uh, and, you know, and, you know, he's, you know, I mean, he's obviously a very passionate, opinionated human being. He's very brilliant. And I don't take everything he says as gospel. I, you know, I actually listen to what he has to say. And I can tell when his opinions diverting away from uh, you know some fact, but you know you can't you can't take take away from a good man. He's a brilliant human being. And he said something that really um, that was really quite profound, and it it, it was and it actually highlighted this um, the reason why my my previous uh, exploration into religion growing up why it was important, and also my age because I you know I'm 55 years old, so I grew up without cell phones and without computers, right? So. So my environment physically, um, I grew up in a hobby farm. So every, everything I did, I was interacting with the environment all the time. Uh, <clears throat> you know, by the time probably I was 13 years of age, I was probably strong as a full grown man because our environment demanded it, right? You know, we had an acre of garden, my father owned a construction company, we were cheap labor. Um, and our whole world was just, we were experiencing the world physically from all these different levels, right? Falling into trees, acres of property to run on, and everything was run and play. And it was the old expression of, don't come home till dinner. See ya. And off we go, we, you know, in the pine forest and 15 feet up a tree and nobody there to say, be careful. And so we had this really robust experience of the world. There just lots of this uh, raw experience of movement, which is why I became a strength athlete, which is why I became good at it, because my history of movement was so profound and without injury, right? So my Jordan Peterson said something, and he, kept, he talked about this a lot about the, what happened in the 20th century. And this really solidified the I Am Project and what I, was, what, I, what I discovered, what I thought I was witnessing. He said the 20th century was the age of enlightenment. 20th century is also when the Catholic Church got stripped of their power in Europe. And, and he said why that was significant is that you know, spiritual and cultural practices have been here since we've been on the planet, since man first developed, let's say, intelligent thought and communication and communities. We've had practices, cultural or spiritual or, you know, combination of both for sure, that were that were kind of the scaffolding which all communities communities were built on. So we had a series of practices. So if I, you know, if I said something or did something within the community, you would understand it because you were a part of my tribe. We share the same practices. We share the same uh, belief systems, uh, the same rituals. And the world at that time was, was way more dangerous than it is today because everything was trying to eat you or kill. Mother Nature was trying to take you out. Uh, the, the neighboring tribe was trying to take you out. There's all sorts of, you know, uh, predators in the environment trying to take you out. So even though we had an incredibly negative uh, negative potential for existence because again and we know that our, we have this thing called negative bias which is 
negative experiences are well are way more illustrated inside of our mind and body. They're higher. They say they're higher nuance. They're more. Uh, um, they're like high definition, higher nuance, more easily accessible to to our nervous system than a than a positive experience. Positive experience are really low low resolution because. You know, that great birthday present you had 10 years ago, like who cares when something, something, you know, a tree is falling or the flash floods coming and you're trying to get your family out of the village. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly right. There's it, it, we had to pay attention to danger because that was important. So that got um, it caused the neurological pathways to be really indented and something happy. It wasn't that important. Right. For our survival. So, yes, Absolutely. exactly. Yeah. You know, so when he when he brought that uh, he, when he brought that forward, then I go, okay, that's really interesting. Okay, so we understand negative bias, but why is why do we see the world so negative today when we've never had it so good? Like he said, we never he just said, you know, that we never had it so good, and 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 the, the stuff you see going on now, you know, we can talk about all the calamities, but you know, we've never had this, right? We never had an iPhone. We never had food to walk into the shelf. We had to kill it or grow it or wait for a season or go hungry. Mm. And, you know, I'm going to stop you there for one second. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was just having a conversation with another friend the other day, just about that, about how can people, if we, we were looking at like the life expectancy, so there's a couple of things you said there that I want to address and, and keep your, your train of thought. That's excellent. Is um, one is, you know, with a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, just the, in a hundred years, it's been crazy. 300 years ago, look at life expectancy, what yeah. it was 300 years ago. Look how people live before plumbing. Look how people lived, you know, and now we in the quality of somebody's life, even somebody that has just a very simple life, a menial job, you know, doing doing something, you know, cash here, something like which is still great. And it's not to take their, their everyone is equal, but just something simple. They live like better than a king lived you know okay. and, and so how and how so how can we be unhappy how can we always look for this way or this reason for, for unhappiness when we live like as you said we want one want chicken we get we go it's our it's all prepared for us and, and and ready to go we have ovens we have microwaves we have clean water we have uh, running plumbing we have electricity we have phones we have all this stuff and we still find a way to be unhappy it, it's <laughs> mind-blowing what else yeah. do you want what do you want you know what yeah. what is it what would it take and then something you said before too about um you know about training and how you were helping people earlier and then you know sometimes you feel like oh, you know maybe i let them down because you know they, yeah. they stopped the routine but i always say that you know self-help it is called self-help for a reason it's up to yourself you, i could show somebody um you can read a book i can't change anybody I can only show them and show them those ideas. And if they can adopt them, they will level up or improve, but it by themselves. So it's self-help. Right. You, you can show someone the greatest health routine, nutrition, isogenics, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> amazing, you know, supplements, amazing way to exercise. And they look at all that and they say, oh, David, that's fantastic. And they, they put it on a shelf and they said, you know, it's, it's, it's not your fault, man. You gave yeah. them everything, you did everything you yeah. could. And the blame isn't on you. And the blame is always for anybody is to take responsibility of their own life. It's always. Right. On. Yeah. Well, well, you know, but it was interesting because when you looked at, but I was trying to figure that negative bias, piece, negative bias piece. I was trying to figure that part out and looking at, you know, and when Jordan Peterson was talking about the, the loss of the, the scaffolding of Judeo Christian culture and that the world was trying to get rid of it, trying to eradicate it, you know, and, and it's not that you have to be a Christian or an, uh, an atheist or you don't have to be of any particular faith uh, or idea. But if you drop underneath the conversation, there was a scaffolding that held everything together. So the world was trying to kill me. Uh, it was a very dangerous uh, life expectancy, as you said, is very, very short. And we had to huddle together. We had to. And, and so we didn't have, we, did, we didn't complain over petty things like we see now. Right. We didn't whine over, because. You, that wasn't your biggest problem today. Your biggest problem today was just staying alive, not getting eaten by that thing and not, not having the, the winter season uh, kill you and freeze your children to death. So we had bigger problems. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche said something to the fact that if you, if you gave people everything they, they needed, all the food they could use, all the food they ever could want, and get rid of all and, and give them all their life necessities. And all they had to do was busy themselves with the peeling of grapes and, and, the, and the furthering of the species. 
they would go out and start breaking things just for something different to do. And and I look at and I look in the world now going, yeah, that's I mean that's kind of what we see. People are just smashing things because, well, it just because life is too good. We don't have we don't have wars going on inside of our countries here that that force us to get rid of all whatever's petty, whatever is nonsensical, and get rid of what doesn't matter to focus on what truly matters, <clears throat> which is survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and have you read Sapiens? <clears throat> heard about the book Sapiens? I, I have, but I haven't read it yet. So. Yeah, so I mean, it's this, it doesn't matter, just so you understand the philosophy, but I think it's really interesting to understand that way, way, way back, we were kind of even with the other animals, right? Like, you know, it was like a, a level playing field. So we had just as, um, as much chance of survival as the lion, I guess, or, you know, within reason, the deer, the this, the, and then it became this thing of um, suddenly of like supreme dominance, right? And, and I think we've lost so much. What it is to be human is completely lost in our society right now. What does it yeah. really mean? Does it mean, you know, I mean, we know what it definitely it isn't, you know, accumulating objects and fancy cars and, and bigger right. homes. We know what it's not, but that still doesn't help us to truly, it's, it's the beginning to give us a couple of clues. What does it really mean to be human? And just because we can dominate, should we dominate? Of course not. Should we, you know, so that's an interesting, I think, thing to think about as well. Yeah, well, it's. Well, again, you know, I think it all goes back to, and where this, where I'm heading inside this piece is that uh, what we're missing now is, is, it's just that, right? What does it mean? What is our core identity? What is our core philosophy? Um, and and what I found with uh, personal development kind of went the way of fad diets. It went the way of fad exercise routines, and so there was no, there's no, um, there's no foundation. There's no scaffolding to build on that. So if I'm going to be a martial artist and I want to my black belt, well, I've got a, at least an eight-year journey, and I start with the basics, and I build the scaffolding, and I build, and I build, and I build until I have mastery. And even at the level of black belt, just black belt means I mastered the basics. And I'm just beginning. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I, I've just, I, I'm, I'm at a level where I've just broke the surface. Now the real work begins. And people, wow, you know, you didn't know all this stuff. I said, I don't know anything. I just have a really good view of what I don't know. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, but that scaffolding part was really important because if I look at if you look at the negative bias that the world uh, that our nervous system is reacting to, and and it's uh, the brain just saying, "What does this mean?" Right? Um, you know, uh, there's you know we have this thing going on in the world. I'm not sure what it is, and I won't get into that conversation. But we have this thing going on in the world that really has disrupted everything, and it's evoking all these responses. But it's different in everyone. And, and the way we respond, so all this information is coming in from the media and from our conversations with friends and family. And so the brain's trying to make sense of it. But, but if, you ha- if there's no core, foundational core premise of how you view the world and saying, this is where I am, this is my core view, my core philosophy, my, uh, and this is, this is this place I'm going to view the world from, then this information coming in, all this negative information is lighting up all these negative experiences straight across the framework of my history, my entire history, right? So fear of that happened, uh, you know, 35 years ago, uh, you know, trauma happened 20 years ago, this bad thing, that bad thing. Because it's like in, a, in the physical body, um, when, I, when, I, when stress comes to the body, the areas that are currently stressed actually get elevated. They, they, the energy inside, let's see, I keep saying, I really I carry a lot of stress in my neck. Yeah, not really. It's not exactly true. What happens is that you have a pre-existing issue with excessive tone in your neck because you've been on your computer for eight hours. So there's too much tone in your neck, right? So that's a neurological issue. So the brain recognizes that there's all this energy here. You have a stressful thought, which is, as you said, it's chemical, but it's also electrical. And the energy goes to the body and it takes those areas that are, that are currently tight and it just winds them up even more. So stress goes to where stress resides. It looks for more of its own kind. Right, and we have a negative experience coming in, and if we don't have, um, ch- we don't have, a, a, say, chosen filters, a way of filtering it that we decide it in advance, and how that's going to happen, right? We, and we have to decide in advance. But if we don't, that information comes in. The brain's going to go, okay, well, you know, say there's credit cards and events, so 
well, this just happened. What does this mean? Brain's going, ah, it doesn't feel very good, doesn't sound very good. You know what, 1974, that, that didn't feel good or sound very good, and it's actually quite similar. Let's use the emotional content of that. But the problem, 1974, is I'm, I'm nine years old. So the emotional maturity of me uh, of nine gets dumped into the body. And Brene Brown pointed this out to me, uh, not to me specifically, but as she was speaking, she's saying, when emotions, when the brain dumps these neurochemicals into the body, into the brain, these emotions hijack the prefrontal cortex and I become nine years old. And my, so when somebody says, that's totally out of character for you. Yeah, totally characteristic for a nine-year-old. That's so unlike her. Yeah, totally like a 13-year-old, but so unlike a 35-year-old female. I'm not feeling like myself. Or actually, I was talking with my, my brother's visiting, and uh, we were talking about this last night, and he said, and why do people say, you just need to grow up? Why? Because the emotions of my childhood and my past are just, those are, those are these crazy filters that are, information is coming in, the brain says, well, maybe it means this from 1974, maybe it means this. I don't know that's going on, because I haven't chosen a core way of being and feeling and viewing the world. So I can't, I don't have the ability to distinguish. I can't filter it. My brain just playing the match game. You know, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel? When did you feel that? When did you see that? When did you feel that? When was the last time? And that's all done by my, my kind of my unconscious mind. And it's trying to make sense of the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. That's very well said. That's very, very interesting. And I think that um, when you're nine, your perception and your beliefs. So let's say we start off, it's not, 100 percent true but a blank slate right and we start yeah. zero to five right five to the genius level we have this kind of thing we start saying okay what is it what is it to be you look at your parents and you say okay what does it be to be a, like you know, role models people around you what does it mean to be a man how does a woman act what does it mean to be a woman and then what does it mean to society and then you meet friends you start building all these beliefs and then certain things like you know as you're saying when you're nine like something like really could hit you in a certain way and be like so traumatic. But if you removed yourself and you're an adult looking at it, you're like, okay, like somebody gave you, um, let's say you had a birthday party and you had like four of, four of your friends were there and they gave out pieces of cake and they just cut it randomly. But you ended up with the smallest piece, just right. just like randomly. And then you said like, oh my God, like they, they don't like me. Like right. obviously they gave me the smallest piece. I'm the most insignificant person here. Right. Do I say something out loud or was it on purpose? Like, or does all of my friends think I'm the most insignificant person, right? You could just go off, right? Yeah, like on this absolutely. crazy negative trail. And now like every time cake is given, like you either cut the biggest piece for yourself to show that like I'm the alpha or, or you know what I mean? These <laughs> stupid things. But it, and, we, and if you don't know, and you have never thought about it, there's certain things I catch myself and I say, isn't that strange that I do that? And I say, why? And I try to reflect, I say, why? Where did this start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that I mean, that introspection is perfect. You know, it's um, well, and and it, it, actually, it's a great segue into how would you know the difference? So again, it goes back to the physical. If you're doing a bicep curl and yet it really hurts your left knee, do you continue doing the bicep curl? How do you know it's a bicep curl? Well, because what it looks like. Where do you feel it? So the question: I'm a bodybuilder, so one thing that bodybuilding I did find was great for a lot, but it was really good for one thing very specifically. To get this, to connect to this, hyper aware. You know, I you know I can get my the bottom of my left lat to contract by itself. It's that hyper awareness of body and that connection to your body. So, so again, it just it was just really interesting parallel. And maybe you know, and again, maybe at the risk of over I oversimplified it, but it just it just made sense to me. And I'm sure uh, people will as they listen to it either they'll you know. Either, and I'm always willing to fill in the blanks of information that I'm missing. So never be afraid uh, to feed me more data because I just want to keep know. I want to keep exploring this idea. But so if I, if I take somebody in the gym and said, okay, first thing we're going to do is that we're going to turn on all your core muscles, right? We're going to, let's say for a bicep curl, for example, we're going to take your shoulder girl and we're going to turn it on. So the shoulders get pulled back in neutral. I'm going to anchor it. And they're going to turn on your pelvic floor. I'm going to anchor your, your shoulders to your hips. And I'm going to soften your knees and then lower your center of gravity. You got that? Okay, I'm in place. Okay. Now, I want you to think about the target muscle. So how do you know that your shoulders are back and down? Well, I did it. So what does it feel like? Well, okay, do you know what it feels like? Yeah, I feel my, my muscles around my mid-back a little bit tense. Okay, do you tighten your pelvic floor? Okay, what does that feel like? Okay, 
I have the feeling. I know what it is, but I also know what it feels like, and I know where it feels. I understand where it is. Bend your knees, lower your center of gravity. Now, what is, what's that feel like? Because feelings drive behavior, right? We know that. So, like, okay, well, this is being hyper aware of the feelings makes it really important because the feelings will tell you if you're on track or not. So, you know, so I put them in this great postural, stable position, position now. And the acronym is SAM. I should uh, stabilize, activate, then move. So, stable first. Stability, you don't do anything unless you're stable. Don't make a decision, don't, make a, don't move a muscle. So, I'm stable. Now, A and SAM is activate. Okay, so what am I training? I'm training a bicep. Okay, what does it feel like to flex a bicep? I don't know. Because most people, their hand is negotiating with the weight, not their bicep. So the sensory information starts here. So I feel it here and I see it there. So what's the brain going to do for somebody who doesn't? I'm a, I'm a meathead, right? I'm a bodybuilder. So I know how to flex a bicep. I know what it feels like. I've done it a whole lot over the last 30 years. The average person who's an accountant, who's on the computer all the time, the brain, the, the memory map of our movement is all about wrist and fingers. It's not about biceps. So the brain will say, what does this mean? Well, it means the forearm. So somebody doing a bicep curl who's not me will use a lot of their forearm musculature and all the stress will be here, not up here, because that's the map of the world they have with moving something up and down. Make sense, right? So I'd say, well, yeah. okay, what does this feel like? Well, where do you feel this exercise? Well, I feel it in my forearm. What's the exercise for? Well, it's for my bicep. So, and? Oh, and they wouldn't get it. So, no, it's just a bicep curl is not the movement. A bicep curl is a process, a think, feel, then do. So, but first you come from the same position, stable. Stabilize your body. Stabilize yourself first. Then what does that feel like? This is what stability feels like, emotionally or physically. This is what it feels like. Good. You need to go there first before you decide what the next part means okay so i'm stable what does my bicep feel like okay so flex it a few times okay you got that not your forearm but just your bicep okay that's what feels though okay got that okay good now stabilize yourself flex your bicep now i want you to think about shortening the bicep flex the bicep and let the bicep move the forearm through its range what does that feel like and all of a sudden their eyes whoops their eyes go wide and they're going oh my god that's so hard i i can't move as much weight and man it's my biceps are burning and it's just all this excitement and going yeah, because that was the point. And, and, it's, uh, and there's a really convoluted uh, sentence that I read many, many years ago. And it, there's and it, it only a couple, two sentences in all the things that I've read that have impacted me powerfully. And the first sentence was out of a book called Basic Physiology for Health Sciences, right? I, I'm, I'm such a geek. But, and this was, I bought this book, I don't know, 25 years ago. And, and I'll, I'll unpack the sentence for you, but it said, Stimulation of, of cutaneous sensors, skin, evokes a prior related experience to aid in the formation of a perception, right? So basically what that means is that when I grab a hold of something, when my, in the, we use exercise as, the, um, as the, uh, the model, I grab a hold of something and my brain, feel, my skin feels, feels the pressure and it's trying to formulate what this means based on what I've already experienced. I grew up on a hobby farm, right? So my ability to move things around, move weight around, my, I grab something, my experience of a previ previous experience of living on a hobby farm with all this physicality, I have a, a multiplicity of references for strength, right? Take somebody who grew up in the city playing Nintendo. Well, we didn't have Nintendo. We didn't even actually have Commodore 64 back then, right? <laughs> Atari. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so somebody who grew up in the city that didn't have my lifestyle, they would grab a hold of something. Their brain would try to do the same thing. It would say, okay, what does this mean? What have I experienced in the past? And they would use their representation to decide how this exercise is going to play out. And that's and that and so that was one of the reasons why I realized the failure rate was so high because if I knew who you were physically in your life, then I had a good idea where I needed to start. Yes. <clears throat> Which I, I had to actually go back and I had to build into your memory. So we have our we have our uh, our life memory, all the emotional experiences that's episodic. Then we have procedural memory, and procedural memory just as it sounds, right? This is how you do this. This is how you drive a car. Yeah. So the procedural memory, we'd have to go back and we'd actually have to. Uh, uh, front, uh, like backload our memory, a movement because it didn't exist. And so the exercises that people were doing, 20 people doing the, exactly the same thing, 20 
different experiences. So we had to make very, very sure that the sequencing was correct. Everybody start at your core. This person has a great, uh, has, has a lot of reference. This person has zero. Okay, but you can't go forward until your core, until you actually have that scaffolding first, yeah. core first. Now, so, and the SAM acronym was really good because it, what I did, it, it made it really simple because obviously I'm using lots of words. But if I said, look, stabilize, all I have to do is teach you, okay, what does stable mean? Knees soft, core tight, shoulders back and down, low center of gravity. You know what it is? More importantly, you know what it feels like. This is what physical congruency feels like. It feels great. Okay, good. And they, and they have certainty. I don't know, and it's not just abstract. It's, they're absolutely certain because they know what it feels like. They know where it is. They know what it looks like. They know where it is. They know what it feels like. And so they can go there instantly. Even in the middle of an exercise, right? The back's starting to bother them. Instantly, the brain says, this is not my core. Instantly, they can stop because the feeling, I get this feeling that says, this is different. This is not good. I know what my core feels like. So they immediately stop before they do something stupid and yeah. hurt themselves. And, and I think I think on that point is exactly is it's just as important to unlearn mm. the wrong things as to relearn the good things, right? So it's like take those bad habits, those bad um idea or definition they have of what core is or what that exercise is. And and amazingly said, it was really interesting what you're saying with the bicep. Well if you always think it, you're always doing it the wrong way. And you're, I love the method that you're using. So yes, you got to unlearn certain things, right, to get it the right way. Yeah. Well, and the brain, it's just going to offer it up. Saying, hey, what do you, hey, you know, Andrew, what do you think? You know, this, hey, this is, should we use this? And you go, no, that, I know that's my history, and I know, I know why I did that because I was on the computer too much. But it's not what I want. But what I want feels this way. Right. And, and, and the feeling part, and, and it took me a long time to really understand, especially when it came to the psychological piece, it has to feel a certain way. So we, so when we just leapfrog back over the fence into the, our psychology, as we were talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the framework, the, 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 what happened in the 20th century, we stripped away all the congruency and all the things that actually grounded us, like you know, regardless of the belief system, right, whether it's Muslim or Christianity or, or Judaism, whatever it might be. But we lost that spiritual practice. We lost that cultural practice, which was the um, which gave us uh, uh, some grounding because it became part of our core identity. And like, and what really brought it to light to me it was that I was with my son in Nicaragua for three months, uh, uh, maybe three years ago, and uh, I was in this old Catholic church and I was watching people watching the uh, the, the, the locals come up and they would come up and pray and. And I was, you know, I'd watch people come up and they'd be kneeling at this, uh, at this altar and people were sobbing. And, and I watched this uh, one guy there and he must have been there for 45 minutes. And, and I sat there with almost, um, almost a bit of envy. And I go, how amazing is that? Like, how lucky are they? Because what are they doing right now? They're processing their stuff in real time. They're not waiting for 25 years to go by. If their whole life implodes to go talk to a therapist. And it's not about Catholicism. It's not even about God or Jesus. It's not about any of that. It's just what they're at, the, the act of processing their stuff in real time. So they're on their knees. They got an issue. And they actually, they, and they're, they actually have a belief in something outside of them, something transcendent. Perfect. So, but they're actually working through it and they're asking for help. Now, whether that help is their higher self, like their, their, their innate intelligence that they just can't access in a state of stress. So they keep asking for help, or maybe it's in their own brain. Who knows, right? Or maybe it's, it's, it's divinity. But regardless of what it is, they're working through their, they, they actually have a place and a method to work through the problems in real time and saying, I don't have the answers. I need to work this out rather than compartmentalizing it, burying it away. The emotion, they work through the emotion instead of actually shoving it away so it actually causes a physical disease later in life. And then they go home to, they go home to a household of people who believe what they believe. Who share the same language and who share the same rituals and in a community that for the most part shares the same thing. And I going, and I, I was, I was, I had immediate envy because I knew exactly what they were, what they were working through. And whether it's Catholicism, whether it's just Tony Robbins, like whatever your stick is, if you pick a lane and stay in the lane and you become practice and you develop faith on the, uh, in the modality of practice, regardless of what it is, um, then that, I think that kind of benefit will be powerful. And, and, what, and they're in this space where they say, well, if God's listening to you or Jesus is listening to you, you know, why, what would that do for you? What makes me feel a certain way, right? My faith makes me feel a certain way. They feel grounded. It's their core. It's their core identity. 
and th they look to the world through that lens. Yes, yes, that's right. lens. And, I, and as you said, like, it's the, it's having faith. Faith is key. And, and you could have, but it's more difficult for someone to have, you could have that faith in yourself, just right. in yourself. But most people, that's very difficult to, to right. so it's easier to say, you know, faith in God or in a religious um, right. belief. But that faith, faith to, you know, uh, the size of a mustard seed to move mountains, that's, right. that, I don't think that's, um, I think that's true. Like it's it's a true statement. It sounds like oh, it's just like kind of an interesting story to kind of you know reinforce how important faith is. No, right. faith is like right. you said with these different things of thoughts, emotion. Faith is is a component. If you right. don't can't be, don't believe that you can get in better shape, if you don't believe your shoulders ever going to heal, if you don't believe you can lift that, you'll never be able to lift it. Right. You know, and I, so I think that's a very interesting uh, component. And I, I agree with what you're saying that, you know, that that working it through. But I also think that in, in my personal beliefs, you know, and there's a wonderful book called Ask and It Is Given. Right? You might be familiar with that. That's uh, Abraham with Esther Hicks. Right. And, you know, and it, it's that if you don't ask, you can't receive. So because we have free will, whether it's God or guides or angels or whatever you want to believe in if you don't ask them they can't the same way if i if i i could be sitting here and i know you david and say man I, I wish i wish david would tell me you know what i'm doing wrong with these 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 bicep curls but i never ask you right yeah, yeah, i see yeah. you every day and i say hey david how are you and you say good and i just go man i wish you would tell me about my how are you supposed to answer it right yeah, yeah. So i'm gonna ask you i'm gonna say David, man, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I'm, I'm injuring myself. I can't, I'm not getting any bigger. Oh, what's going on here? And if I ask you, you can give me an answer yeah. and, and I can move forward and, and better right. myself. And I think that's one part. And then I think I always think of that thought. I said, what worries me is not what I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know. What worries me is the things I think I know, but I am wrong. Right. And that's always what's concerning for me. So I think it's really interesting, those, uh, those things. And I think that you're your method methodology is so important. I'm big system systems yeah. guy. Okay. So I always have my wallet in my left pocket. I have my keys in my right. If I take out anything, I take out everything. So let's say someone's house, I'll take out my wallet and my car keys. And my, I'll never take out one thing because I might leave with my car keys, to start my car and go, Oh no, I forgot my wallet. Right. It cannot happen because I'll take up all of them. So it's just because it happened to me before. So I make right. system upon system uh, to the littlest things. I know when I, when I get gas, okay, it's going to sound silly. You know, and it's not as profound as what you were talking about. <laughs> but when I go to get gas, I have a perfect method for optimizing my time. So I pull out my, my you, know, you know, card, gas card, yeah. and I put it in. I know it takes three, two, one to be able to pull that out and I know okay now I need my visa card and now before as it processing before I put my pin number in I have x amount of time so that time I'm going to use to open my gas tank right to open right. that now I have that money so I've optimized the whole mm -hmm. thing to have the quickest experience of of in and out of that gas right. station as possible and everything that just goes on to washing dishes making yeah. a pizza uh, everything and I think these are so important it sounds maybe it's uh, maybe I go too far but I, I don't think so <laughs> for, for myself is having those those things it just makes me my life more efficient it makes right. me on time I'm rarely early and, and never late I'm always like like exactly on time because I, I, my mind is used to it so how long does it take to do these things and then if it um, if I do go and I'm ever late for something I address it with calm with no I don't get right. mad at myself I say what happened here and how do I adjust that procedure so that it, it's on track next time yeah well the beautiful part about that stuff I mean you know some people you know are listening might go wow OCD you know you, you know you need help or or more importantly is that how much bandwidth do I free up because I'm not having to do things twice and I'm, all, I'm always trying to jumble this massively disorganized life and brain